So I want to just uh, take us through what I hope will be a brief session, uh, just beginning to now hone this down to even our uh, structures at Mavuno. Um, but I have a question before I go there. Why, in your estimation, if you remember that, you remember the diagram that has the attenders, the members, the family, the army, and the movement. Um, why, why do you think it's so critical that you become a family before you become an army? Why does family come before army? Why do you think that order is so important? Yeah? Maybe just talk to your neighbor for a second, just make sure they're awake. Like, why is that order important? Why can't you just be an army directly? You want to be an army? Just come in and command people. Tell them what they need to do. Who needs family? Why do you need, why, why do you need that order in place? If you're starting a discipleship group, why is it so critical first you form a family before you even try to be an army? Why is, it so, why is family so critical that it comes first? Why family before army? I just want to answer this before we go into our next place where we now begin to hone down on our structures. All right, all right, all right. Where are my people's at? The people with the microphones, all right. Why is it so critical? We have to start with family. We have to start with family before we go anywhere else. What does family do? Why is it the key that unlocks this movement? Okay, let's hear a few answers before we jump in. Uh, somebody here, somebody at the back. If you're holding a mic, that's good. If you're holding a mic, then I'll let you speak. All right, let's start here. Um, you, can, you can say what campus you represent. Good afternoon, Mabuno Church. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Collins Okeo Obora. I come from the illustrious, wonderful, um, army-loving, under the stewardship of one amazing Pastor Gordon Mutai, the <laughs> Lifeway okay. Network. Thank you. Yes. Just say the name of your network. You don't have to give the Lifeway whole introduction. <laughs> um, we become a family first because we have to learn to first speak the same language. And we learn that from a family. Wow. The same values from the family. And to have that love and camaraderie before you move forward. So that you know that you can, before you, I can be able to die for someone else and be there with them. I have to first love them. Yeah. So love allows us to then be able to build. We build on love. We don't just want to jump in and assume that people love each other. All right. Uh, I can see someone right at the back who's been standing. Yeah. Ah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right, Maderi here. Oh, that's Maderi. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Right, so it's in family that we learn patience, love, and sacrifice. Wow. And those are great attributes that will be needed in the army. Yeah. yeah. It is yeah. in the family we love to be one. And so that is important. And also, when we are one, we're united, we have, we'll be able to avoid friendly fire that Oof. can kill in the army. Wow, wow. By the way, guys, again, this is stuff you're going to teach, huh? So I hope you're taking notes because you're responsible for it. Uh, he's saying that, you know, you avoid friendly fire because then you, you teach patience. I mean, you, you, he said it so well, I can't even repeat it. He said we, it's a place where you teach patience. Um, patience, love, and sacrifice. Patience, love, and sacrifice. You from Hill City, I was told I was didn't say where I come from. Oh, excellent. Right. Those are smart people there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Maderi. Come on, guys. You can appreciate him better than that. Yeah. Awesome. Someone right at the back. My, my name is Wilson, uh, Mashariki Campus. Come on, Mashariki. Uh, I believe cohesion and harmony in the family gives the impetus to advance together as an army. <laughs> hey, sh you better understand English before you answer after this. <laughs> So cohesion gives impetus, that's what I got. Clearly, I need to 
I, I didn't go into this, but he's really saying when you have that cohesion, that oneness, then you can advance together. So uh, for those non-English speaking people, okay. Uh-huh. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Charity Wayakiwe Campus, Downtown Network. As we were discussing with my very wise husband here. Hey. <laughs> Um, well, so he said it's from family that we derive identity. Um, otherwise, if you're just an army without that sense of identity and common vision, you're just like mercenaries. You can go to the highest bidder. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You become mercenaries. Mercenaries fight. You can be in the middle of the night thinking you have an army tomorrow to attack. Then you wake up and they're all on the other side. They've all crossed over. And that's because there was no cohesion, no sense of identity. This stuff is practical, by the way. There are some of you who have led discipleship groups and you know that you can actually find yourself in friendly fire. Or you can find yourself, the pastor has said, we are doing this, and your people are looking at you like, and who are you? Yeah, that's what happens when you haven't built family. All right, are you standing? Okay, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Wanjiko, Hill City. Come on. Uh, my friend over here told me that she grew up in an army family and what she, she said, she what come on she shared <laughs> that tells you where i come from uh is that in a family you know each other's strength so in a military let's say the bed needs to be made straight in this uh, long shoes needs to be polished in this way i know my strength is in polishing shoes yeah. so we'll share duties according to our strengths wow. and so there is synergy there is teamwork there is love Hey, if you're in a military family, we can only say, forgive us, your rights. Like, oh my gosh, like I respect anybody who grew up in the military, like even a military child, yeah. Teach us discipline, please. It was hard, yes, I, ca I cannot doubt that, but thank you for that contribution, yeah. Uh, Robert, Hill City Campus. Uh, for family, it's where you get the stronger sense of belonging. Yeah. There's the values that are being taught that now it's under one place. But in the army now, there's a common purpose, a common goal that is supposed to be achieved. Wow. That can't be done in the family simply because we're just belonging there. But in the army now, we put all our values, all our strengths, all our weakness towards achieving one goal yeah. and doing one thing. I love it. Yes. I love it. It's a foundation that allows us to push forward. And Jackie said, that's my son, come on. <laughs> I love it, that's, I love the family here. All right, at the back, and then we'll have one more person standing, I think, um, yeah, and one last person on this side. Okay, okay. Benedict, my name. Benedict, uh, go yeah, ahead. From Mashariki. Yeah. I think for me, there are too many examples. Like, uh, the first one is uh, family business have got a longer longevity than individual business, which yeah. is after you are gone. And then politics, monarchies, political families last, uh, last longer than people who just run alone. We hear them one election call never again. Yeah. <laughs> and then also when you look at uh, <laughs> uh, when you look at uh, arts, music, when you look like the Jacksons, the family, all of them were successful more than people who they had one musician. <laughs> so <laughs> why is it not in the church where we should have family? Because family is the cross-cutting success factor. Wow. Hey. hey. Uh, this man is a business consultant, you can tell. Uh, but he's right. Why can't you be a dynasty? Yeah, why can't your family be a dynasty in the Christian faith? Why can't you be the one who starts a new dynasty of fearless influencers? That everyone in your family will be a fearless influencer. Family can do that. Family can do that. All right. Uh, my name is Victor, Victor. from uh, Mabuno Connect. Come on, Victor. Uh, that is under South Network. We were discussing with my beautiful wife. Different. Come on, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were saying that uh, family provides the conducive environment. It's more like a nursery or a hatchery or a greenhouse Eish. where you can, uh, they can be uh, developed and grown with love and yeah. care. Yeah. They can be corrected, like even the time Jesus corrected his disciples, wow. like get thee behind me, Satan, with the zero <laughs> chills. <laughs> But with love, and until the point when they are ready to, you know, to go out and and deliver I love for it. the movement. I love it. Thank you. I really love that. I don't think I'll forget that illustration. It's just shared. It's like a nursery, 
and then when the, when the babies are ready, they're transplanted out in the field, which is the army. And the nursery is where you look after them, you nurture them, it's that hatchery. Wow, that guy's a farmer right there. You can learn a lot from people from different uh, professions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Pastor John, downtown, but I am a neighbor to track record, and yeah. So we are saying in the family, vulnerability is allowed. Yeah. Because you don't want to look vulnerable in public. Yeah. And then, of course, we are kept accountable. We, yeah. are, we account for each other. Yeah. So when I'm failing to follow hard, guys in the family can ask me, what are the issues? Yes. I'm able to open up at the family level yeah. as opposed to when I was out there. And then the other thing that is very important is that the vision is carried forward. Yeah. Because if the vision dies with the leader, then it wasn't caught. Yeah. But then yeah. the continuation happens in the family level because we have children, we have teenagers, we have adults, and then, of course, the senior citizens and the Caleb generation, as we call them. So basically, there's that continuity. Yeah. The vision doesn't yeah. end with the leader. Thank I you. love it. I love it. Thank you, Pastor John. Let's appreciate him. Uh, you know, it's interesting. The families are those places where you, you say, are you guys talking to your brother? Have you ever been told that by your, by your parents? Has anybody? Talk to you. Why aren't you people talking to your sister? Because in the family, you can actually, there's a conducive environment where people can even speak to one another. You're building a collective responsibility. Now, what we are saying, by the way, you better not forget it because this is why you don't want to come to your discipleship group and tell guys, We're an army. Why are you all late? On day one, <laughs> you've lost it. You've not built any of those things. And why it's so important for you as a DG leader to understand, I need to build a family. I need to become a master at building family. I need to figure out how to make people come around. I've had to become that. Uh, I've had to learn how to, be, to build a family of individuals who are different, who have different ambitions and different plans. And to actually, being a father means bringing them together and helping them see that there's something bigger than themselves. And actually helping them to love one another. Um, I remember in one of our conversations, in some of our hard conversations, we reached a place where we said, look, I don't have to be the one to rebuke somebody. If you guys see somebody misbehaving on this team, talk to your brothers and sisters. Like, you don't have to wait for the leader to be the one who's always telling people, why are you late to our meeting? You should be able to take each other out and say, this is not appropriate. Um, we agreed that we can talk, we can say anything. Anybody can say anything on the team. And just, it's a place where we can be vulnerable with each other. And so we, we, I had to learn how to build family out of people who are not a family. And that's a skill every one of us has to develop. Why do we have to build a family first? Um, I'll give you a couple of other reasons. Number one, obedience without love is legalism. If you want to become a cult, <laughs> proper, now I'm speaking about cults, then what you want is obedience that has no basis. There's no love, there's no relationship, it's all on the basis of you do because the leader said there's nothing else. Yes, we're an army, but we're a family as well. Families trust because of relationship. And that's how we become, if, if, you, if you don't do that, you're going to become the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees had disciples who obeyed them as well. But they were not what Jesus wanted. They were not the kingdom. In fact, Jesus called them the sons of hell. Yeah, don't become a son of hell by giving people orders and you've not built love and trust among them. It's extremely important that we build family. Family means we care for each other. It means when somebody is sick in the group, that group is the first point of care in the church. You cannot be admitted in hospital and I show up to visit you and your, your DG members have not shown up yet. That would be a breach of protocol. <laughs> the immediate family, it's like strangers coming to visit you before your family members have shown up. Uh, in, the, in the spiritual realm, your DG is your next of kin. So you have to build that into the people so they love each other that way. When there's a wedding, when somebody is going through a crisis, it should be DG members who are organizing, how do we care for this person? How do we take turns to make sure we do a caring call? How do we visit their house? Um, in a DG, one of the things that you do is you, you, you try and organize your social calendar so even if it's once a quarter, you visit one of your parents or one of your homes. So that you're making sure that you're, you're actually getting to know each other beyond just the meeting. Uh, some groups have been good at doing this, especially when you live in the na same neighborhood, which is why we like geographical DGs, because you're able to visit each other's homes and actually take turns host hosting. 
And what does that do? You'll never know a person as well as when you're in their house. Yeah, I, you, can, you can show up in church looking like this. When I come into your house is when I really know who you are. And that just moves some of those barriers. Um, my discipleship group, they know my parents. By the way, you know someone's parents, they, you cannot uh, pretend anymore to be something you're not. Uh, your parents are so real with you. <laughs> okay, I won't go into too many details there. <laughs> I could tell a few stories. So anyway, get, get build, you don't want to build legalism. And obedience, what we are talking about, the army, in the wrong context can be abused. And it's only in the context of family that people will say, I want to follow. And they will follow without, I have to follow. Number two, love creates trust and covers over a multitude of sin. We talked about trust, so I won't even go too much into that. But it's true that love creates trust. Uh, when you build that trust, then you're able to go into the battle and you know, people have my back. Somebody's looking out for me. And that allows me to follow without thinking. I mean, imagine that, that thing that Major Boke shared will never leave my mind. That there are 10 of us and one of us has to stand up so they're killed so we, the rest of us know where the sniper is. So that we take out that outpost. <laughs> that sounds impossible. But I can tell you guys this for a fact. In my biological family, if my father said, one of you has to take a bullet so the rest of us will live, I will stand up. And I know I'm not a hero because many of you do exactly the same thing. I'll take a bullet for my siblings. I would. I wouldn't even think. I would. And I know my brother would as well. In fact, he would be fighting for who's going to stand up between us. Because that's what family does. That's what family does. So this is what you want your group to be. Because when there's love, it just creates trust. And it creates that sense of why wouldn't I sacrifice for this person? Why wouldn't I be there for them? Love does that. And what does, what does family mean? It means that we offend each other, but we are still related. Yeah, yes, I got, I got chill. I got, I got hurt by what somebody said. I walked away. People came back and said, we are your brothers and sisters. Where are you going? You have nowhere else you're going. You belong. So that's why, as a discipleship group leader, you want to make sure that you're building family. Uh, because love, I mean, family, it creates trust. And then lastly, I really think family gives people what's in it for them. The thing that drives us as humans is what's in it for me. If we're honest, uh, what's in it for me? What will I get out of this? And you know what? Jesus said to his family, follow me and I will make you. Within a family, there's a place of blessing, there's a place of inheritance, there's a place of conviction. Many people here work for their family businesses. Your father calls you and tells you, go and help me with this thing, and you run after it. He's not going to pay you anything. He tells you there's this land issue that is stuck. I need you to leave what you're doing and help me get it done, and you go and do it. They're sick, and they need someone to go and get something. You don't stop and ask, by the way, how much are you, uh, uh, like, how can I set my clock? How much am I being paid by the hour? It's like, mom is sick. I go and do it. I do it because that's my family. But you know, in the family, I know this that we're working for is ours. There's an inheritance in the family. Uh, it's different. I don't, I'm not a wage, because if, I'm not, if there's no inheritance, then I have to work for a wage. When there's no wage, then there has to be something much bigger than that. And the thing that I suffer is that inheritance. In a family, we have inheritance. So I think I wanted to say that because it's very easy for us to talk about why we must follow, why we must follow, why we must follow, and we forget the first lesson we learned. Going to the army without family, you're missing a step. And it's going to be a very high step. And many people are going to fall because they miss that step. So I want to challenge. How many DG leaders in the house? Let me just say, show of hands. All right. Praise God. By the next gathering, by the way, when I say that, your hand will be up in Jesus' name, right? Yeah, because we're all leaders. We're all disciple makers. So, yeah, please take time to build the family. Let me move us to the next um, thing that I was going to do. And like I said, this one is not long. Um, it's called battle formation, the last one, if we can go to that one. Um, battle formation, it was the last uh, set of slides. It's interesting, again, the, the major spoke about battle formations yesterday. And he spoke about the fact that the army has different formations. In an army, you don't just rush into battle, all of you. Have you ever watched, uh, is it Braveheart? You know those movies where it's like all the guys just raise their spears and then they're in a line and they're like, oh! <laughs> you don't do that. You'll be so dead. Armies have units. They have formations. 
and he talked about things like uh, battalions and companies. Does any of you remember those things? And sections and all those things. Those are formations. Those are battle formations. In the army of Jesus, we must have battle formations. And that's what these are. Just go to the next one uh, that shows our battle formations. Those are our battle formations as Mavuno Church. Right at the middle, you have your discipleship group. That's your section with a copro in charge. All those guys who raise their hands, copro. That's, your, that's you. You're looking after the smallest unit of the army. That's who you are. Then we have an MC, a missional community, several sections. Many times they have the same lineage. They used to be a DG that multiplied. And then you have a zone which has a, a sec, an area of the church. It's like your battalion. It says, for Pastor James, he says, Great Wall is a zone. And that zone has a zonal pastor. And that zonal pastor is the one in charge of that whole zone. All the MCs and all the DGs in that zone come into that one area. And then he has Athi River. And he has Mlolongo and upwards, Mombasa Road. All those are zones. And every one of our churches is divided in zones for this purpose. And that's why your pastor has zonal pastors as the people that report to them. Uh, it's, it's extremely important because in this season, we're saying every single person in Mavuno Church is being discipled by someone and is discipling somebody else. So this is your battle formation. You, you begin to understand what's my rank? Where do I report to? Who's the person who's helping me to be, achieve my mission? Uh, and your DG leader is, your, is the smallest one. Your compass becomes your next one. Your compass is not a, a world in and of itself. It exists within a larger family. And it's always important for you to understand that, that we're not just us. We're part of something much bigger, but we represent that big thing. When it comes to the most effective armies, by the way, uh, if, you, if you're a student of, I was going to say a student of war, I don't, I'm, I don't think that sounds good, but I actually enjoy reading about military generals. I've always done that since I was young. And I've loved stories of people like Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Genghis Khan, uh, Alexander the Great. I've, I, I love reading their stories. I don't know, it's, for me what's fascinating is just the leadership behind it. You can't lead an army if you're not good with people. And these guys were great with people. Uh, one of the, some, of the, some of the things you're going to find out is the most effective armies in the world, the ones that won the biggest territory and became the most famous, actually all the ones I mentioned, one of the secrets they had is they had an extreme ability to have two realities that are opposite. The first reality is a very strong centralized identity. They had an incredible strong centralized. So you had Julius Caesar or, or Napoleon, and he was the undisputed leader. So they had a very strong leadership at the center. But then the units in the time of war, in the time of battle, all could think at one, as one because they understood the master's intent, wow. the commander's intent. So Napoleon would fight armies. Those days, armies had to stay close. They didn't have walkie-talkies or anything. So the armies that would be fighting would have to stay very close to each other so they could hear the master's command. When the general would shout, he'd have to have people running with orders to be able to run to get the army. So the army would have to stay very close together. Napoleon was very different. He had a, a situation room with his generals, and he gave them the commands, and he left the battle to them because they all understood the objective is this. So they did the strategy before the battle started. When they entered the battle, every unit, every section understood the orders. And so basically you'd be fighting a section, but it's an army by itself. Because the order, the rank, so they didn't even need those long supply lines and long, every unit understood how to forage for itself, how to take, because they understood what the strategy was. And that's what made them effective, because he empowered the people under him to lead. It's the same in the kingdom of God. If you want to be effective, your DG leader has to be empowered to lead. Wow. They have to understand their identity and their authority. Oh, come on, you guys, you've forgotten already. <laughs> you have to understand your identity and authority at the smallest level. You have to be able to understand that. So you understand when I'm a DG leader in downtown, I'm representing the movement. The movement. I'm representing uh, the top command. I understand what the orders are. That's why I came to the gathering. I understand where we are heading. I'm listening to the orders when, they, when we have the, con with the, con the conversation with my, my zonal pastor, uh, Pastor Wamboi. But the rest of the week, I'm not waiting to be told because I understood the orders. I took them and I'm executing them as if I was the general. 
And that's, that's how good armies do it. So we've got campuses, we've got networks, and basically, for those who are new, networks are a cluster of campuses. Uh, several campuses are under one uh, network pastor. And so you've, got, uh, you've been introduced to the different networks as we've been going along. Right now, I think we have how many networks? Is it four or five? Five, five different networks. Uh, I believe they're going to expand as we go because some of our campuses are in the process of becoming networks in Jesus' name. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. It's happening. Yeah, it's happening. Um, and then movement. Movement is basically the, connection, the collection of all our networks uh, together. And right now we call ourselves a movement. But there's another ring that is one that we haven't talked about much. I don't even have a name for it yet, so I've just put a suggestion there. Uh, and basically, it's the movement of movements, where movements start to be born. And right now, there are certain incipient or birthing movements happening at Mavuno. Uh, one of them is the Swahili campuses. That's a movement in formation. A time is coming, by the way, when the Swahili campus movement might be bigger than this English-speaking one. And they're going to grow fast, in Jesus' name. Yeah. You'll be seeing them, and they'll be the biggest uh, network. We've, we're, there's an, a, a, a birthing of a French-speaking movement. Uh, it's coming. Uh, we keep challenging Pastor Mugisha, Pastor M uh, Mishu. These guys are our bishops for Francophone Africa. It's, especially Pastor Mishu. These guys don't even speak English. They're Francophone. And I can just see Francophone Africa and even the French-speaking world uh, being rich. This guy right now has a DG that started. Here's the thing that happened at the last gathering when we went to Bunjumbura. This was such a crazy story. There was a guy who came to the gathering, had recently come to Christ. Um, and I remember after the gathering, he came up to him and to me and he said, I want to be baptized. I'm about to relocate to Canada and I've gotten the brief. I'm going to go and start a, a discipleship group and it's going to become Mavuno, Ottawa, I think. Huh? Montreal. And they've started already. How many are they now? Okay. So they've been showing up for 4.30 prayers, by the way. Like, I saw them at the 6 o'clock. When we were doing the 6 o'clock, 5 to 6, to, was it 5 to 6? 5 to 6 prayers. He was there with his DG. And Mavuno, Ontario is already starting. That's a French-speaking church, by the way. So when we talk about a new movement that is being birthed, it's actually happening. Uh, we have movements about to start with children, like children's churches, like not with adults running them, like run by those children. Uh, right now, we've got a few that are in, in formation, and you're going to start hearing about them very soon. And even those ones, I think, will outgrow us, by the way. Uh, there's a way that children have a heart for the Lord. Huh? Uh, they take a lot less convincing. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're starting youth churches, and we're going to have a movement of churches that are just led by young people, uh, high school and college people, and those are already starting as well. So what happens at those points is at some point you end up becoming an, a grouping of movements, because I believe each of those movements will have their own leadership, they'll have their own bishop, they're going to have their own system, uh, and we're just going to be joined together. You saw Pastor Angie? Pastor Angie is actually starting a movement that is not necessarily the same, but it is the same. Yeah? And she's not the only one. There are others that are starting like that. And so basically, what this means is we are part of a much bigger family. Doesn't that make you feel good to know you're part of a global family? Yeah, already we're a global family. Uh, and God is going to do some certain things uh, through us as a congregation, as, as an army, as we do this. Now, let me just ask then, with that light, this is the last question I'm going to ask. Why is the discipleship group then so important? Why is it so important that we get DGs right? Yeah? Why is it so important that we get DGs right? Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah? Maggie, just say it. Yeah, we can have a few, just a few. I feel that. Make sure it's turned on. Uh, sorry. Um, You're a I DG leader. Why is yes. discipleship group so critical? In my opinion, I feel that it's a uh, basic, the most important foundation for what we, we're about to do yeah. in the bigger movement. It's at the foundation. And it's very it, critical. It's primary school. We get it right. If you don't get primary school right, university will be in trouble. <laughs> it's a foundation. Yeah, you're going to say something? Pastor Kelvin? All these are DGs, just in their millions or thousands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you don't get it right, you get nothing else right. 
If you don't get it right, you get nothing. That's right. Pastor CJ, you're going to say something. It's the easiest place to break down everything we're doing. And there we can have one-on-ones that would be very difficult to have when we're in our hundreds yeah. and our thousands. It makes it very intimate. You can have the conversation at the smallest level. All right, there's somebody at the back. Yeah. Uh, discipleship group, I think it's the core of everything because even as you have illustrated it on the slide, it's the in, it, at the center point of everything. So I think discipleship group is so critical because it helps us build families into yeah. armies, into movements and everything. Come so on. it's the core. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just turn it on. All right, this may sound so direct, but it's the mizizi, it's the roots. So this is where we get all the nutrients that we need. Yeah. And uh, about self-esteem, about um, who we are, I like the way we learn and um, in our DGs, we learn about the basic, basic things like relating to other people. So this is like, um, because I learned yesterday from Major that in military, it's continuous training. Yeah. So I can say it's like the first training institute I before we go oh all the way goodness. up. That is so good. Yes. That is so good. The discipleship group is a place for discipleship. It's that training space. Did you hear that people even learn how to go to the toilet? Yeah. And guys, that's not a small thing. As a DG leader, you need to understand that my role is actually to help my people become everything God wants them to be. It might mean that I have an honest conversation with my son in the DG and say, there's something called mouthwash that I need you to start using. In fact, I bought for you one. Yeah. There's something called underarm deodorant. And if you use it, you won't be smelling bad when you enter where people are. I mean, that sounds like a, a very parental thing to say, but you are a spiritual parent that the people in your discipleship group should start looking different and distinct because you're their parent. It is the place of basic training. It's a place where you have a conversation with somebody and say, okay, by the way, allow me to say something personal. I hope you don't mind. I'm just saying this out of love. But I feel like there are times when you speak to your wife and you raise your voice a certain way that cuts her confidence down. And I, don't, I, I know this is your staff. I'm not trying to enter into that. But I do feel as a believer that I want to actually encourage you and hold you accountable. Could you do this differently? And just try this and see what happens. Yeah. And you'll be surprised. Because people are, people, are, people are looking to be parented. And in the discipleship group, that's where you learn to be a parent. That's a really good contribution. All right, let's go. Yeah, it's an opportunity for all of us to participate and lead. Amen. Yeah, come on. That's right. That's where I hone my leadership. That's where I begin to learn to lead, and it's a place where everybody gets a chance to lead. Did you, 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 you heard him talk about the fact that everybody in the army is trained? Everybody is trained and seen as a leader and taught to be a leader. Yeah. Okay, okay. somebody else was already standing? Okay. okay, let me come back this way, then I'll come back, yeah. Um, I'm Rita from Connect. Now, um, thank you. Uh, the DG is the mitochondria. Ish. of the cell. It's where the energy, the powerhouse of the whole system flows oh. from. Wow. Hey, okay, sour, sour, Rita. We, end up, we get you. Some people are getting cold chills because they remember the last exam where they saw that word and how they burnt the book after that exam. <laughs> it's a mitochondria. It's, it's basically the energy source. If your DGs are healthy, your campus will be healthy. If your DG is not healthy, your campus might only be the energy of the campus pastor at the top. But as soon as the campus pastor sits down, the sermon is over, the energy just goes down because the mitochondria are not firing. Come on, you mitochondria people. Yeah? <laughs> All right. It's hard to go after mitochondria, yeah. but I'll try. Um, the DG is just the way the nuclear family is. The DG is where the devil begins the attack. Yeah. Wow. And That's so, so profound. Even as DG leaders, as you'd mentioned, there, there's, we need to deal with the issues yeah. um, that are there yeah. in, a, in a different way, yeah. understanding the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if the devil wants to attack you, he just needs to get the DGs to stop praying. Yeah. And so as a DG leader, you need to understand, you're, you're the powerhouse for the church. 
That's why your interest should be that everybody in your DG is at 4.30. And it's your job to get them there and parent them there. Because if we are not praying, the church is not praying. And just to understand how important we are for the success of this church. Thank you so much. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. Uh, the DG is a root of the movement. A strong root, a strong, t a strong tree. Yeah. A weak root, a weak movement. Yeah. A weak yeah. tree. You're so right. Yeah, very good. Love it. Love it. All right. And Pastor John. So yeah. the DG where leaders are identified, born and developed. Yeah. And it's where we learn to be who we are in Christ and then our conduct. Yeah. And as leaders are being developed, identified and born, it's commensurate then with the people who are coming in because we leave addition to multiplication. Come Thank on. You. I love it. We stop addition. You heard what he said. You know, he talks in such profound ways you can miss what he's saying. He's saying the church can be growing by addition, which means Pastor James is preaching good sermons and people can't come and hear our pastor. But when the discipleship group becomes a place of growth, it becomes multiplication. Because imagine if all the DGs in Mavuno Church in Hill City brought one new person to church. The church, you would feel the visible number surge every Sunday. Just one person a week. And you said, all our DG, we're just bringing one new person. Between the eight of us, just one person. That's not hard. And if they did that, the church would start to grow in a radical and viral way. The DG is actually the place of multiplication and not addition. Wonderful. Oh, you have one. Okay, we've got a couple more and then we can, or one, one more and then we can uh, conclude. Uh, my name is Yasser from Hill City. Come on, Yasser. Uh, I believe uh, DGs are just like uh, a garage. Yeah. Uh, we need, we are broken. We are really broken and we need restoration. Yeah. Because if you are not restored, you are not able to perform. <laughs> just like a yeah. car. Wow. Wow. The DG is where the broken sons and daughters come in and they are restored and they are prepared to be an army. I'm hoping I'm giving you a sense of how important your role is as leaders. Because if your DG is weak, then by just by it will just extra it, uh, it will extrapolate to the church the church will be weak and the army will be weak so i want to talk a bit about the discipleship group uh the job description of a discipleship group leader and this ones are just very just just short job descriptions let's go to the jd of that one let's go to the jd go to the next one next yeah so i've, I've just done a few of them um number one Disciples, the members of the discipleship group, that is the core understanding. You are a discipler. It includes meeting them weekly at the discipleship group meeting. By the way, if your group is meeting virtually, it's your job to figure out how can I try and make these guys come and meet live. Because you do know that there's, there's a limited place we can get to. Imagine trying to bring up um, your infant, Pastor Mboy, who's about to have an infant. Imagine bringing them up virtually like they're in the nursery and you leave them there, you're just sending food and then you just meet them on Zoom. And it's like, hey baby, say kuchiku, mama loves you. Like, that's messed up, isn't it? You have to be there, they have to hug, you have to hold them, you have to look after them, you have to see the, the, from the expression, are they crying because they're hungry, are they just crying to make a fuss? Some things are caught when we're together. And so as a digital leader, you need to be figuring out how do I get these guys, these busy people of mine to want to meet virtually and how do we make this part of our rhythms. Uh, uh, ensuring they attend 430 prayers. Come on, this is the place they're going to be trained to pray. This is the place they're going to feel the power of acceleration and multiplication on their prayers. If they're not praying together, they're going to be at the place where they're struggling because they don't have an army surrounding them. Uh, family night. I want them to catch the vision of the movement because remember... In my unit, in my section, in my DG, I am raising movement leaders. It's a place of training. So if I'm the only one who's been trained and everybody in my discipleship group leader is a follower, that's all. They'll never be a leader. You're not training anything in them because you're not putting them in the place of exposure so they can actually become a movement leader like yourself. They need to be able to grow up to lead where you're leading so that you can go up to another level. And so it's very important for you to make sure that your people are in that, that place, that they're reading the Bible. You want them to learn to hear God for themselves that they're growing in generosity, all those things. So when we have a conversation in church, it's not just what did you hear God say, what are you going to do? It's almost being able to say, guys, here is something I've learned. So one of the things I've done with my DGs, I've told them, guys, for Pastor Karen, here is the app that we use 
to track our monthly expenses. And here's how we are able to, as a couple, uh, keep each other accountable in how we spend money. And here's how we can tell you how much we earned last month, because it's right here. We have clarity. We have a good dashboard together. And so we told them, after to telling them that, that was a nice thing. Then we commanded them, you shall all download the app. By then, they were a family, so they understood. And it's like, by next time we meet, we want to see all your expenses and your income in that app. And it's because we want them to grow. We want the best for them. And so it's your job to make sure we're not just doing what we did on Sunday, but you're taking it deeper for them. And you're saying, how do, we, how do I help you to grow, to become? And by the way, you don't have to know everything as a discipleship group leader. Remember, you're also following. So you're just doing what your pastor has done to you. Whatever you've been trained, pass it on. Right now, maybe, you've, maybe your DG members are not in the gathering. I'm hoping these notes you're using will be things that you actually say, let's have a party, let's have a sit down. I want to share with you some of the things that I learned. Uh, it's important for you to be, or even being able to say, hey, can we take the first video? Uh, I want us all to watch, and then on WhatsApp, we can all share our takeout. I mean, you can actually make sure that you're growing your people. So you disciple them. Number two, planning for visits to group members and by the group to each other. You want your group to care for each other. And one of the ways we do that is called visitation. So being able to either visit each other and have discipleship group in our members' homes, or somebody is sick, we all went to see them in hospital. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's such a beautiful thing when you teach your group to care for each other. And it's your job as a disciple. You don't have to do it, but you can make sure it's done. Good leaders don't do everything. They learn how to delegate, isn't it? And you can actually say to somebody in the group, I want to appoint you to be my, my helper who helps me with the area of visits. You're the one who will coordinate which house we are meeting in or who we are visiting. Our care our pastor in the group. Uh, you ensure that the group cares for each other through life's milestones. I think that's connected there. Holding the group accountable to do evangelism and invite people to grow the group. It's your job to grow your group. Because your campus pastor can't be sending people to you every Sunday when people come into church. It's your job to be able to say, here we are in Great Wall. We're in Great Wall 1. We're in this block. And we're meeting because we're in this block. How many of our neighbors do we know who don't come to church? Can we invite at least, try and invite one person a week so we have an extra chair being filled? And that as we grow, we get to a place where we're full and we're able to even say, you brought these four. Why don't you go next door in the next flat and start your own? And that's one of the ways that we've seen our groups beginning to multiply. Where is uh, um, sons and daughters? Where are the sons and daughters of? If you're in sons and daughters, just stand up. Those sons and daughters people, are they here? Oh. <laughs> Allah, where is your group? They'll all be here. So this man has, how many groups are sons and daughters? So he started with one group. He and his wife multiplied it. Now there are three groups. They even all call themselves sons and daughters one, sons and daughters two, sons and daughters three. You can actually see Mavuno sons and daughters starting out of these guys. Huh? They have such a strong sense of identity. They have such a strong sense of passion for God. And because they have fun, their friends easily come to the group. Like their group is a fun group, so they, they actually people, they just invite their people, and their group has just been growing. And I have no doubt in a few, in a short while, there will be six groups. Uh, isn't that true, Pastor Godwin? I mean, is that, is, you, can, you can see them multiplying even beyond that, can't you? And how do I even know them? Because they are so proud of their group. Like you can't go to life where not even hear of sons and daughters. Um, and, and that's what we're saying. It's your job. To multiply your group, to have pride in your group, to invite people to multiply it. Guess what's happened? People have come to Christ because of these guys. Uh, neighborhoods are being reached because of these guys. They're able to even strategize and say, this area needs a group. There are two of us from that area. Let's take over that area. I mean, this is a military operating at its smallest unit and causing havoc to the kingdom of the enemy. Come on, sons and daughters. Yeah. <laughs> So it's your job to make sure that your people are inviting. Let's invite people. Let's have, even if it's let's once a month, let's have a bash and invite people um, and, 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 and eat some food together. Or let's do it every week. Let's just have food. And there's always a place for us to say, we're a fellowship that meets in the neighborhood. Can you come and join us? We just want to hang out and we always have food together. Uh, number, is there number six? Is discipled by and connects regularly with their MC leader. So if you're a discipleship group, group leader, you need to be part of somebody discipling you. In some of the churches, they might not have an MC structure yet because the groups haven't multiplied. And in that case, you're, you're discipled directly by your own pastor. But there's somebody who's able to shepherd you as you're shepherding others. And then they attend the DG leaders' trainings. 
with their apprentice. Why are they going with their apprentice? Because they love that apprentice so much, they know that they're going to be a leader as well. They're already preparing them, one or two apprentices, to start their next groups. So when I come for leadership meetings, I want to come with them so that they're getting exposed into those spaces. And then ensure weekly reports are sent to your pastor. So this week, out of the seven people that are usually here, there are five people. Each of the campus pastors has a, has a way that they want their reports. So ensuring that that report goes either to MC leader or to your pastor. So that's as simple as it is. That's your job. You don't have to do it all, but understand you're in charge of a section. You're in charge of something important. If I do my job well, this army succeeds. It's, the army is only as good as its smallest unit. Uh, and you know, if we do that, if we go to the next slide, um, you can see what a missional community, no, no, just, just the one you were on just now, yeah. You can see what a missional community looks like. You've got the MC leader. Uh, that was the original DG leader, but their members now have started groups, either individually or in twos or threes. So now they have four groups that are being led by four of their sons. The MC leader now doesn't form a new DG, but they end up shepherding those people. So your job is you're the missional community leader. So you, if you start your own DG, it's almost like... Is this too sensitive? Have some people done this? It's almost like we grew up... When we got jobs, our parents had another family. They had more children, and they forgot about us. Even though we're adults, we'll still feel it, isn't it? It's like we're still your children. I mean, I want, I want you... I, you can't have... I don't want you to have other children at this point to my parents. I want them to be able to look after my children. Imagine if my children were competing with my parents... My, my young siblings for the attention of their grandparents. Now who is the grandfather there at that point? So I want my grandparents to have moved up to being grandparents so they can help me look after my children. Does that make sense? So in the spiritual realm, it means that when my people have planted their groups, I stay on and I'm able to help become their shepherd. And basically what then happens, if you go to the next slide, which tells us the description of an MC leader, that person disciples the original members. Uh, discipleship is for life. Discipleship is a lifelong friendship. It's a long-term friendship. Um, Jesus didn't have his 12, and then he said, go and make disciples. Okay, who are the next 12? <laughs> he didn't do that. He said, you're the ones upon whom there will be the foundation. The book of Revelation says even the new city in Jerusalem will be built on the foundation of those 12. It's like those are the guys he has hung out with, and he still hangs out with in heaven. Those are his people, his peeps. Uh, they're the elders who are there before his throne. So he had a long-term relationship in mind with them. And one of the things I tell, to my, I tell my team over here, I say to them, we're going to be together for a long time. Yeah, we're going to love each other for a long, long time. I say to them, when you're old, I will still be your disciple. <laughs> I will still be happy to celebrate you and rejoice in your victories. I'll still be here to support you. And so they disciple their original members. So it might be that we have a monthly meeting. It might even be on Zoom, but it's a way of just catching in, checking in, making sure somebody's caring for them as they're caring for others. Uh, and maybe even visiting their groups, because now I don't have a discipleship group of my own. I could be visiting their groups just to make sure that they're doing well. Uh, organizing the months, the monthly frontline missional engagement. So what happens when you're an MC? Every month, your group should actually have a missional engagement, whether it's a children's home, whether it's a school ne next door, whatever it is, uh, an artist community that you're discipling, whatever you're doing together to impact your community. Because we're here not to just be spiritual, but also to engage the society around us with the spirit. So you're the one who's able to say, of the three groups we have, this is the place we're going. We're going to this prison. It's been the place we went when we were one group. We're going to continue now. And guess what happens? When you multiply and now you're several groups, the thing that causes people to fear multiplying is because we're such good friends. Huh? Kifalme, now ajua, now ona, huh? It's like a group here who love each other so much. What are you Let me, allow me to speak to you. You cannot stay in one group forever. It's like my children growing up and refusing to leave home. Yeah, we become adults in the house. Have you ever had that conversation being had where the father says to the son, who was it was telling me just now that that's convers that conversation you have with your son where you say, now, son, there cannot be two jogos in this house. Huh? The house has become small for us to be, for me as your father, to be waiting for you to come at three and have not slept that you are going to see your girlfriend. That is not the way it works. It's, it's time for you now to find your own house so that I'm not worrying about you when you're late because it's good for you as a young person to be late. 
but not in my house. <laughs> By the way, my children are laughing because we've had that conversation. You know, a time is coming and has almost come. <laughs> when those who worship God shall worship in their houses, in spirit and in truth. So, so it's important that if you keep your kids, and you know the problem is sometimes we, keep, we hold on to our kids for so long, we actually affect their growth. We affect their confidence. We affect their ability to actually be men and women in their own house. And so we have to get to a, to a place where we actually gently launch them and lovingly launch them. And so that's what the MC leader does. And then now you're saying one, the family get together is monthly when we come together with all our disciples and we hang out and we have a party. And we go, and we go to that children's home and we make a difference. And it's your job then as the original leader to organize those. Coaches and encourages, uh, number three, go back. Coaches and encourages discipleship groups under them to evangelize and multiply. So it's your job to coach. You become a coach. You become good in learning coaching. If you're an MC leader, you have to learn how to coach. And I think we're going to have to start doing some coaching, uh, 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 teaching, uh, and helping our, our, our MCs become good coach, coach, uh, MC leaders become good coaches. It's your job to be able to say, come on, guys, what can we do? What are best ways? What are the low-hanging fruit for your group? How can you guys invite people? Uh, it's your job to make sure that your groups are growing and healthy. Number four, you're discipled by and connect regularly. So you're also discipled. This, the, the thing about this thing is somebody is always discipling the discipler. And so you're discipled by your zonal shepherd or your campus pastor. And then attending regular MC leaders trainings, because there are always trainings that are offered to help you get the skills. And then you have an MC report. An MC report at that level is when you're able to say, of the three groups, I've received their reports, I've consolidated them, I've sent them on to my zonal pastor or to my campus pastor. So it's simple, isn't it? So what we're saying is, these are units in an army. These are not just spiritual conversations we're having. This is how we actually become fearless influencers that change the world. This is how we create the structure of support for every one of our ministries that we're going to launch into the society. This is how we're going to plant churches globally. Uh, by the way, I, I can tell you one thing I've stopped doing. I used to write proposals for people to send me money to help us plant international churches. Ah, why do we need money to plant churches? We have God's people. These ones here, I'm praying for them to be promoted so they can go out of this place. Yeah, because I'm saying now, we're going to become too many. I'm going to start saying now, you know, our father, you're, you're too big now. We're, there cannot be two Jogos in Hill City. Uh, in this, some of you need to be going already to take continents for Jesus. To start the work of the Lord in different places of the world. And, you know, equipped, but also supported. That's the beauty of the family, isn't it? Uh, when you're sent out by the family, that discipleship group, you went out, you got a job, as, you got a calling as a student to go to Canada or to go to Dubai or wherever it is, but there's a group that owns you. There's a group that supports you. Even as you're going to start your own group there, there's an MC leader who's looking out for you and who's making sure that you're not isolated. This is how we make sure that we leave no one behind because that's one of the things that the church sometimes does very badly. We leave people behind on the field when they've been shot. And we're saying, no, 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 we're not that kind of army. We leave no one behind. So this is kind of like, I wanted to just give this um, as, is there another slide? Is there one at the end of that? Uh, okay, this one just shows the MC leaders have a zonal pastor, and there are MC leaders, four of them now, and each of them has their own DG leaders group, which each have their own. This is how your campus grows. It's a military structure. It really has a general at the top who's your campus pastor, and then he's got, he's got their zonal pastors, they've got their MC leaders. They have got their discipleship group leaders, and then they have their recruits, <laughs> who are the DG members, who are going through that basic training of learning to be a family and being taught to be leaders. So this helps. Does this help a bit in the context of all we've been talking about? Is there a last slide? Uh, no, no, go to the next one. The last one. All right. Guys, 2023, the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. And the key, the key to that is following hard. If we will follow hard, if we will learn to follow our leaders, follow our discipleship group leader, follow our MC leader, follow our zonal leader, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start to see God do some amazing things. And this is how we build the, what do we call it, the bucket for revival. This is how when revival comes, we're ready for it. When the rain starts to pour, we have something to collect the rain. We have something to organize by. When God starts to send people out across the world, we have ways to support one another. By the way, when we started, since we started this, one of the things I used to always have in Mavuno is a lot of complaints, HR-level complaints. 
People just said, we don't feel loved by the church. We don't support it. We don't feel supported. You sent us out to this country. There's no structure to support us. Oh my goodness, it was so much pain. But since we started this, wow. Family is the best thing that ever happened. I mean, Pastor Kilonzi can tell you, when his international pastor showed up in town, he had already planned for them an overnight, like two-night retreat. These guys had fun. Before they came here, they've had more enjoyers like nothing else because they're a family. And they showed up here. They don't need Pastor M to get a therapist for them. They've already done all their therapy. They've done all their issues. Now they're ready to be a, an army and to be charged. And this is how we become an army that doesn't even need to spend budget to care for one another. Because families, nobody sends an invoice to their child or to their mother uh, because I cared for you in hospital. Here's an invoice for my fuel. Nobody does that. We care because we love each other. We care because we are one. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together on our feet. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon, like I said, we're going to have an open, we're going to have what we call like a, a townhouse. We're going to have an open session where we're just going to have a conversation. Uh, we're going to have some of our pastors up on stage. They'll be sharing some of their experiences with this. We'll be taking questions. We'll also be getting testimonies of how this has been working in different campuses. And the whole idea here is that by the time we leave today, we're done with this army conversation. We're ready to empl employ it. We're ready for what tomorrow has for us. Amen. So, so, so I want you to just now have a moment with your father, just before we go for lunch, have a moment with your father, because I believe that your father, our father, is calling every single one of us to step up, to step up in the following game, to step up in the kingdom game. The Lord wants us to understand that everything you have is for the sake of his kingdom. It's a gift for his kingdom. Your job, it really is a tool that God gave you so you can make disciples. Sometimes we get it twisted and we think that maybe my job is the thing that I balance with the work of God. Not understanding the job is actually the thing to help you do the work of God. My family is a tool for discipleship. It's not something I put on the side. There's something we call family on mission. We have to do mission together as a family. My husband, my spouse, that's something God has given me so that we can do missions together. Some of you, by the way, you're the only believer in the family. Your spouse is not a believer. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. You follow. And this year, watch God begin to do some things. And even before that, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if God is also not opening your heart. So that by the time your husband is coming around, your wife is coming around, you will have a ministry to people who are in the same situation. Nothing is ever wasted with God. Nothing's ever wasted. Some of you are in a place right now where you're struggling and maybe you're not, you don't even have a house, you don't have a job and you're wondering, is this for people who have made it, people who have a job, who have a house, who have a place they can invite people. But guess what? God did not look for the most qualified people to make his disciples. He looked for people and then he qualified them. And you know what? Right there where you are, as young as you are, maybe you'll be meeting your disciples under a tree somewhere. But guess what? Maybe God wants you to raise a generation of people who are like you. So that by the time he gives you a job, he's also given you a mission and a purpose. And so don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise where you are and say, oh my goodness, I don't know. Remember, this thing is not about how much you know. It's about how hard you're following. And so just pray for yourself right now. Somebody needs to say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to do your will. We had what Pastor Oshika taught us. Just say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to serve you in my generation. I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to just live for myself. I want to achieve the mission that you brought me to here on earth. Come on, just say, Lord, I surrender. I'm ready. I'm ready to be used by you. The Lord will never force his will on you. He wants you to be the one who invites him in. So just invite him in and say, Lord, I want you to take over. I want you to use me. I'm not too old for you to use. I'm not too young for you to use. I want you to use me as I am. Father, thank you for your children right now as they're coming before you, setting the grounds for the revival, setting the grounds for you to use them, setting the grounds for your Holy Spirit to come. Lord, we are ready. We are getting ready. We want your reign to come because the vessels are ready. Lord, we are ready to be used by you. We want you to use us, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Receive every prayer that's coming up to you right now. Receive every couple that is praying together right now and saying, Lord, we are ready to be used by you. Every single person, every young person, every old person, receive that prayer right now that says, Lord, I'm ready. Use my talents, use my skills. 
use my possessions, use my job. Lord, you made me specifically for purpose. I'm not going to waste that. I'm not going to be somebody who just lives as a bystander. There's a, big, there's, a, there's a battle that you've called your church to. I'm going to be in formation. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And so, Father God, even as we, we, we reflect on these words, I pray that, Lord, you would raise us to be a fearless army. I pray that no one will be left behind. And Lord, look at these ones. These are the, they're the beginning of that mighty army. You know, it strikes me when the 12 were following Jesus, they didn't know there would be the beginning, the foundation of a mighty army. When I look at this congregation, Lord, I see the foundations of a mighty army. I see an army that will change the world. I see an army that will be known across the world. And I see people who will say, I was there when this thing was starting. I was there when this thing was small. And God has used me. People who will be able to say, God has used me to be part of what established the work of God in my generation. I thank you, Lord. Cities are going to be taken by the people in this room. Lord, I see a seed. When I look at these people, I see a seed. A seed that is going to fall on the ground. And that seed is going to give fruit, give fold a hundredfold. That many others are going to be blessed by the people in this room. Thousands upon thousands are going to be blessed by the people in this room because they are yielded to you. And so, Father, I just bless your children now. I speak every blessing upon you, son of God, daughter of God. Ah, you are the army of the Most High. You're the sons and daughters of God. I bless you. I bless you as a father. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And people say it. Amen. Amen. God's army said amen.